Hey everybody, before we begin today's segment of Weight Loss Wednesday, I just wanted to remind you that tonight, Wednesday, November 2nd at 5 p.m. Pacific time, we kick off our eight webinar series with myself and Dr. Gustavo Tolosa on how to navigate the holidays without the usual weight gain. Our guest tonight is food addiction expert, Dr. Joan Iflin, and we have other wonderful guests scheduled like Dr. Doug Lyle, Dr. Alan Goldhammer, John Pierre, we've got another doctor that's a possibility and some lay people that have solved this problem. So consider joining us. You can go to www.eatunprocessed.com and register for the webinar. And that's also where you go to sign up to be on my email list so that you can submit questions for Weight Loss Wednesday. So let's get started. Hey everybody, I'm Chef AJ and welcome to this week's installment of Weight Loss Wednesday where I answer your questions about healthy, permanent, and sustainable weight loss. With me is my good friend, Kenny, who is holding the camera. He's gonna make every effort to hold it really still today because I know a few of you have complained. So uh, we really appreciate Kenny doing this for Forget us. So them. be nice to Kenny. He's single, he's adorable, he's vegan. So he's volunteering his time and he is holding the questions. Just so you know, Weight Loss Wednesday, as always, is filmed before a live studio audience. Yeah, you tell them, Bailey. All righty. So what do you got for me this week, Kenny? All right, we got seven questions. Wow, that's a lot. <laughs> and the seven questions start with the first question. Good. <laughs> Very good. Is air popped popcorn a good snack for weight loss? You know, I get that question a lot, and in my opinion, it's a horrible snack for weight loss. If you truly understand calorie density, which is the foundation of the Ultimate Weight Loss Program, and also the foundation of many of the wonderful plant-based program. The McDougall program for maximum weight loss talks about this. Dr. D. Mornish talks about this in Eat More, Way Less. The True North diet, at True North, the health promoting diet, these are all based on the principle of calorie density. You would understand that when you do understand calorie density and apply it, you can literally eat twice as much food and take in half as many calories by eating foods that are not only the highest in nutrients, but the lowest in calorie density. Well, popcorn is 1,800 calories a pound, which means it has the same caloric density as sugar, which most people understand is not a health food nor is really a weight loss food. And while people say, well, I don't really eat a pound of popcorn, well, here's the thing. A pound of whole corn, corn is technically a whole grain, is only 500 calories. If you wanted to eat a whole pound of corn, you could. You probably wouldn't be able to. When I've tried to do that after two or three years of corn, I was full. But the problem with Air Pop popcorn or, or pretzels, cereals, even though they may be fat free, is that we've removed the water. And the problem with when you remove the water, you decrease satiety. Because in order to feel full, especially if your goal is to feel full on fewer calories so that you can facilitate weight loss, is you wanna make sure that you have both the fiber and the water intact. You wanna eat the whole food in its whole food form, not in any of the processed food form. And so what happens is when you make Air Pop popcorn from whole corn, you're taking a food that was 500 calories a pound and you're more than tripling the caloric density. And again, there's less satisfaction, less satiation when you've removed the water in the foods. So I don't recommend it at all for weight loss. As a matter of fact, when Dr. Goldhammer was asked this question once when I was working at True North, he said, that's a great snack if you're trying to gain weight. The other problem with Air Pop popcorn is, well, there's a few other problems, is it's a hand-to-mouth food. So if you're su somebody that suffers from food addiction, you don't wanna be eating hand-to-mouth foods because what they can do is perpetuate overeating, they can trigger a binge, and so if people insist on eating Air Pop popcorn, I recommend that they eat it with chopsticks. I learned this from my partner, John Pierre, using their non-dominant hand because that will really slow you down. So. I don't recommend Air Pop popcorn for anyone trying to lose weight. The other thing people do is they put a lot of nutritional yeast on it. Nutritional yeast, it's okay. You know, it's, you know, Dr. Goldhammer doesn't like it and he doesn't let us use it at True North because it's such a concentrated uh, processed food. It's actually pretty high in calories. You know, it's almost as high in calories as nuts, even though it may not have the same amount of fat. And so again, you know, the other thing I want to address is, why are you needing to snack? Because if you're eating enough food at your meal times, especially enough starch, you shouldn't need to be needing to snack. At least that's my opinion. Because no one could have become overweight or obese unless they ate out, unless they consumed outside of the demands of true hunger. And if you need a snack, you're probably not hungry. You're probably 
having cravings because of emotional reasons, you're stressed, you're tired, you're angry or lonely or bored. And when people want a snack, I'd like, fine, you know, eat a salad, eat a raw salad with a, a, a fat-free dressing or eat some vegetables. Because in my opinion, if you're not hungry enough to eat vegetables, you're probably not hungry and you're eating for reasons other than hunger and survival. So I'm just not a big fan of snacking. If you need to snack, eat food. You know, if it has to be something crunchy or something creamy or chocolatey or salty, you know, that's, that's not hunger. And if you're trying to get that under control and lose weight, I don't recommend snacking. And you're getting lots of teardrops. People I'm putting so messages sorry. Across. I know <laughs> it, you know, air pop popcorn is better than obviously popcorn popped in olive oil or coconut oil with salt or, or kettle corn, which is sugar, fat, and salt. But sorry guys, it's 1800 calories a pound. So are pretzel cereals. It's not a weight loss food. It's not going to hurt you. It's not like it's going to hurt your endothelial, but it's, it's not going to make you skinny. Especially so. ones with the chemicals that they have already to go in a little bag. Right. Little microwave ones. Yeah. So I'm sorry about that. There's some misconceptions that it's a good snack for weight loss. I've not seen that happen in any of my clients. Well, here we have people from Ohio, Minnesota, Arizona, wow. Wyoming. Nice. Thank you and, for watching. Um, where's one other state I saw? I forgot where that was. Close by. Thank you. Um, so they're coming around. We Thanks, got lots guys. of states Appreciate here. Appreciate you watching. And if so, you have questions, submit them to my website. <clears throat> yes. Yeah, submit them to the website. Next question here comes from Kim. Kim wants to know what is the best way to get on track if you fall off the wagon and ah, drift. Okay. Drift. Kim, Sorry. the best way is to not fall off the wagon. And I mean that with all the love in my heart because I've worked with so many thousands of people now and it's just devastating when people that have been doing so well that have lost maybe even 100 pounds relapse and often gain half of their weight back. So. You know, they say prevention, a pound of prevention is worth an ounce of cure. I think that's the saying, or prevention is the best cure. It is so much easier for those of us that have successfully dug our way out of the tra pleasure trap and have lost weight and stabilized our brain chemistry. It is so much easier to stay compliant than it is to continually having to detoxify and withdraw and neuroadapt and become compliant. That said, I understand people are gonna relapse and that, that's really the, the term I prefer because there technically is no wagon and you really don't fall off. I've relapsed myself and so. Halloween just happened. We have Snickers and right. peanut butter cups that's and all why that it's stuff so at home. That's for you guys to sign up for our Navigating <clears throat> The kids holiday. left. Yep. Well, the food's here to eat. It is the biggest relapse day of the year is, is Halloween and I see people relapse on Halloween and don't recover until January 2nd and unfortunately research shows that that weight you gain from Halloween to to January 2nd which can be you know anywhere from one pound to ten pounds it's weight that's generally never taken off so I recommend if at all possible don't relapse and so you know they say the best uh, the best offense I'm Kenny I'm bad at football is it the best defense is a good offense or is it the best offense is a good defense so what's the best way to get back on track if you do relapse okay well, so in the Ultimate Weight Loss Program, we teach you recovery tools that are going to hopefully help you not relapse in the first place, but that doesn't mean you won't. So you need a plan, and your plan is going to be unique to you. Reaching out is one of the best things you can do, and unfortunately what I've noticed with food addicts is they tend to ask for forgiveness, which of course we're going to give them instead of permission. And if you could reach out before you relapse or very soon thereafter, you're gonna nip it in the bud so that it's not gonna become a 63 day binge from Halloween to January 2nd. That really helps. And so while I don't think you have to officially have like a sponsor like they do in AA, having a mentor, having a supportive group like we have in UWL, a place where you can post your triumphs and your challenges, that's really, really helpful to have a support system. And so we can get you back on track. But what are the things you actually have to do to get on track? So what I recommend is you will not starve if you don't eat for a day. Now, obviously, there's probably people with certain medical conditions or maybe the elderly that shouldn't fast or shouldn't fast at home. Now, I don't recommend doing a water fast on your own. Uh, that's what True North is for. It's medically supervised. But a person could go 24 hours without eating. You have enough glycogen in your body. I mean, assuming you're not running a marathon that day. And one of the things I recommend when people relapse is don't eat until you're hungry. Now, most relapses don't happen at breakfast. Most people tend to relapse later in the day or after dinner, after work, late at night. And so if you binged, or a lot of times, unfortunately, a, a relapse isn't just eating like 
you know, one mint that you shouldn't have had. It usually opens up Pandora's box to eating more food than you intended and not necessarily the kind of food that you normally eat. It's usually sugar, flour, alcohol, chocolate, some high fat, high salt foods perhaps. And so what happens is it ends up being way more calories than you needed for that day. So if you relapse at night, seven, eight at night, maybe eight to 10 o'clock at night, you know, you're probably not gonna wake up hungry in the morning. You might be able to go 24 hours without without food, with just having water. Not that you have to go that long, but the idea is, is after you relapse, don't eat until you're hungry the next time. Truly hungry, you know, biologically hungry. I'm not talking about appetite or cravings. And make sure that the next thing you eat is something healthful. I recommend vegetables, but if you can't do that, maybe make it starch, like a sweet potato. The other thing I recommend, if at all possible, is to try to avoid relapsing by using like the tools that we give you in the Ultimate Weight Loss Program, having a regular meditation and exercise routine, using the essential oils that John Pierre recommends. But one of the things we all can do, myself included, is that if we're tempted, and we're going to be tempted because we live in a world where you can't go to the hardware store without seeing M&Ms at the counter, is that make sure that you never get too hungry, number one, and if you are tempted to fall off the wagon, just make yourself a promise that you're just gonna eat something healthy first. I recently interviewed Andrew Spudfit Taylor. It's archived on under the video page of the page you're on right now. And he is doing an all potato diet for a year. I think he's lost almost 120 pounds now. And he said when he started out, he didn't he would have cravings. Maybe he wanted a piece of chocolate cake and he didn't say, I can't have chocolate cake. I'm never gonna eat a chocolate cake. But what he said to himself is, okay, I want this chocolate cake, and if I still want it, I'm gonna eat it. But first I'm gonna eat these boiled potatoes. And every time he did that, the cravings for chocolate cake went away. A lot of times people are trying to diet, so they're just eating very low calorie dense foods like fruits and vegetables, not eating anywhere near enough starch for satiation. Your glucose is low. So what I would say is just make a promise to yourself or if you're in a group that, okay, you know, I'm gonna be at this holiday party, I'm gonna be tempted by this, and maybe I'll eat it, maybe I won't. I don't have to decide right now. I don't have to say I'm never gonna eat these, but I'm gonna make a promise that if I do eat these, I'm gonna eat something healthy first. And if you do that, and I'm not talking about a couple lettuce leaves or a piece of celery, I'm talking about something substantial, like maybe a serving of rice or beans or a roasted sweet potato or a baked potato, and then do that. And if you still wanna eat it, and maybe you will, maybe you won't, but I bet you you'll eat a lot less of it, and it won't have that impact is it would if you were to eat it when you were hungry on an empty stomach so that's what I recommend and the other thing is if you relapse you know forgive yourself we're not perfect almost everybody probably Dr. Goldhammer's probably never relapsed but the rest of us we're mere mortals we have but the sooner you get back on track the easier it's going to become one of the problems with relapsing if you've been abstinent for a while is I believe I talked about this on one of the previous uh Facebook Live installments when we talked about Philip Seymour Hoffman, is if you're an alcoholic and you stop drinking for a period of time, when you're alcoholic, you're drinking every day, not to feel high, not to feel good anymore, but just not to feel bad. But once you've abstained from alcohol from a long, from a long enough period of time, and then you relapse and have that drink, now it's like even a more pronounced high from the dopamine. It's like the first time again. And so what happens with these foods, these sugars and flours, it does the same thing. And so that's why, you know, do whatever you can to have a relapse prevention plan in place and then have one in place for what you're going to do. You know, what you do is going to be up to you, but do something. Just don't let these 63 days go by with having it one be one continuous relapse. Get back on track by eating something healthy as soon as possible and make sure you always eat enough food so that your blood sugar is stable so that when you see a cupcake at a party, you're not drawn to it quite as much. Thank you, Kim. Okay, we have people from Australia and Ooh, Canada here. Nice. <clears throat> On both sides of the coast in Canada. Cool. Well, so, welcome. Someone's asking how often do you work out and exercise? So we'll get to oh, that actually, questions. Oh, actually, I think that's one of the questions yeah. today. I'm happy to answer that. So Roz wants to know, our third question, mm -hmm. if a volume eater is a food addict, is, I, stick to a, I stick to the left of the red line foods, but if I make roasted sweet potato cubes, I eat beyond my satiation point, even if I have a couple of pounds of veggies in me. Okay, so is a volume eater a food addict always? I don't think so. So if you've ever watched interviews with Olympic athletes, they'll talk about how they eat 10,000 calories a day when they're training. 
and I don't believe that they're food addicts. I mean, they might be, it's always possible, we don't know, but, but in general, they have to eat that huge of a volume of food in order to sustain their workouts. So is every volume eater a food addict? I don't think so. I can tell you that I was not a volume eater until losing weight, and I was a food addict, and I'm still a food addict, albeit in recovery. So I was just talking to my husband about this the other day, because now that I understand calorie density and eat in accordance with its principles, I eat twice as much food as I did when I weighed 50 pounds more five years ago. And the reason is, is because I'm eating foods that are to the left of the red line exclusively that are calorie dilute, that range in calorie density from 100 to 600 calories a pound. These are foods that I didn't eat for the first 43 years of my life. I didn't eat any foods, fruits or vegetables and hardly any whole grains, legumes or, or potatoes. I ate all the foods to the right of the red line. And even though I was 50 pounds heavier, I didn't eat that much in quantity because the foods I was eating were so high fat, high calories. So I would eat a rich dessert. And the joke in my household was is that I always ate dessert first because I was worried if I ate a healthy dinner or if I even ate any dinner first, I'd be too full. And so I wasn't eating large volumes of food, but enough calories and fat from desserts, even healthy raw vegan desserts to keep me fat because these foods were so, so high in caloric density. So I was not a volume eater then. But now, because I don't eat sugar or flour or chocolate or nuts or seeds or avocado or oil, I didn't eat animal products for, it's been almost 40 years now, I have to eat more food in order to sustain my weight and not lose too much weight because I don't wanna lose you know, too much weight either. Now, if you're familiar with the work of Dr. Barbara Rolls, who I interviewed on my teleclass, she's done more research in the field of calorie density than anyone else. She says that most human beings eat about three to five pounds of food a day. And that's all across the world. Doesn't mean that we eat, I eat the same amount as Michael Phelps, but that's about what we eat. But now that I'm slender and eating differently, calorie dilute foods, I need to eat about six to eight pounds of food a day. And I do enjoy that I eat these large volumes of food. Now, if you're, if you're finding that when you eat certain foods, you have trouble moderating the use of them, like sweet potato cubes, because sometimes when we change the form of a food, we tend to overeat on it. Because here, cubes to me, sweet potato cubes are like the air pop popcorn. They're like a hand to mouth food. Would you overeat and eat past satiety if it was just a roasted or a steamed or a microwave sweet potato? That is one question I would ask you. The other question I asked, uh, would ask you is, you're saying you eat past satiety means that you are already feeling full and you're keeping on eating. So my question is, is have you ever suffered from any kind of an eating disorder, bulimia, anorexia, binge eating disorder? Because we have to figure out why you keep eating past satiety. Are you trying to fill some kind of emotional eat, need by keeping on eating when you know that you're biologically full? Because if you are no longer eating these high calorie, hyper palatable foods that produce more dopamine in the brain, and you've committed to eating only the left of the red line, what I've seen happen in a few of the UWL members is they will overeat on whole natural food because what they're really looking for is the high, the drug, the dopamine they were getting from these high fat, high calorie foods which they're abstaining from. And can you get it from overeating? Maybe a little bit, not to the degree, but that's what I think you're looking for. Now, Dr. Ifland is the uh, first guest on the webinar tonight. And if you're signed up for the webinar, I encourage you to ask her that question because I've heard her speak before saying that, that these feel-good chemicals do get produced in excess when we purposely distend our stomach in overeating. So I would ask you what's going on emotionally that you feel that you have to keep eating past satiety. There are tools that people use, like weighing and measuring, which I'm not a fan of, but if it works for you, do it. You know, maybe just make a rule that you are going to only eat 80% of what's on your plate. That's a thing called har harabachi, it's a Japanese word, hacha, I can't say it, harabachi boo, where they eat till 80% full, knowing that if you're still hungry, you can go back for more. But to me, it sounds like some of this eating that you're doing is emotional eating. Now, as far as these things in our stomach called the stretch receptors that Dr. Lyle Goldhammer write about in the book, The Pleasure Trap, I do believe that people vary in how sensitive they are. Now, I don't know if because I've had a history of both anorexia and bulimia that mine are, I don't wanna say broken, but maybe less sensitive. I know that my naturally thin husband, Charles, he can detect 
how much fat is in a meal, even if you don't tell them. When I was making them smoothies, I used to try to sneak in nuts, and I didn't tell them because they didn't, or, or hemp seeds, which don't have a taste. And he'd say, what did you do to my smoothie? I got so full, I couldn't drink it. He has very, very sensitive stretch receptors, and I've eaten many meals with Doug Lyle. Both these guys, they leave food on their plate. I, I, I couldn't do that. I mean, I guess I could. It's something I'm working on because I feel I still overeat a little bit because food is, it's still pleasurable. So, you know, again, without knowing you Personally, with I think what could be going on is partly emotional and partly because you're abstaining from the foods that produce the dopamine, you're still looking for the hit of the drug. And so what you're doing is since you can't have this, you're just gonna have more of this. And so that's what I think is happening. So we need to find other ways to feel good. And the best way that I can think of is exercise, particularly first thing in the morning, doing other types of mindfulness practices, meditation, maybe volunteer work. So thank you for your question and I hope I answered it to uh, your satisfaction. Couple who are asking about the left of the red line part, and that's all part of the ultimate weight loss program. Yes, yes, and, we can uh, show them the, the madness talk, they you want. can hear yeah. about that. Yes. Yeah, and please consider joining the ultimate weight loss program, especially during this challenging time of year. Where do we go to sign up if we want or are interested more? Go to eatunprocessed.com. If you go to the ultimate weight loss page, you'll see several free videos that explain this concept of eating to the left of the red line. And we go to the page is eatunprocessed.com. Eat, the word eat followed by the word unprocessed. Okay, we got the next question from Ashley. It's the big long one. Oh, it's okay. And it talks about exercise. Someone mentioned that earlier. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering who that was. Mm -hmm. uh, so Ashley wants to know, she exercises a lot. And Good. what exercises did you do? She wants to know what exercises you did when you were losing weight. She says she's a healthy weight, but still has to lose about 10 to 15 pounds left. And she's wondering how, many, how much exercise does she need? She walks 10,000 steps a day. She does some body weight exercises, but I'm also wondering what, wondering if I'm really need to do more. Should I just be patient and trust the diet or should I do more? I really don't want to do more to be honest. <laughs> oh, that's, the, that's your answer right there. So first of all, uh, congratulations on getting 10,000 steps a day. It's a great goal to work towards and you know having a pedometer is a wonderful tool for us to use or a Fitbit so that we can shoot for that and one of the easiest way I know of getting I'm only at 3,000 oh so far gosh, today. Oh my gosh, well then you have to take Bailey for a walk. So I'm at 10,000 every day because I have a dog that can actually walk now. When I had elderly dogs I wasn't at 10,000 but that's one of the best ways to get to your 10,000 steps is to get a dog and walk them at least twice a day. I do two 45 minute walks or if you can't have a dog, volunteer at your local Humane Society. Those dogs really, really need to be walked. So I'll answer the first part of the question first. What did I do to lose weight exercise wise? I'm ashamed to say nothing. The good news is, is what this does prove is that you, as John Joseph, who I had on um, one of the first episodes of Healthy Living with Chef AJ, you can never outrun a bad diet. So the reason I didn't exercise while I was losing weight is because many of you know that I had a really bad accident in February of 2010 where I severely fractured my knee, was in a wheelchair, it just wasn't healing. And so I couldn't do any exercise. Now the reality was is I wasn't doing any before I broke my knee, but now I really couldn't do anything. And so I started my ultimate weight loss journey on January 2nd, 2012. It's been five years now. And I did not start exercising until I lost almost all these 50 pounds, I believe, like when I was about 47 pounds into the 50 pound weight loss. So only, we can only attribute like these last three pounds that I lost probably to exercise. Dr. Esselstyn always says that diet definitely trumps exercise. It's not to say that exercise isn't important. It is very important if you're trying to recover from food addiction for the brain stabilizing uh, effects that it has, but I just couldn't do it. And so, what happened is John Pierre, who runs the Ultimate Weight Loss Program with me, he was saying that I really needed to start exercising, and I said, but I don't like to exercise. And he said, well, you tell people to eat vegetables for breakfast, and they say they don't like it, and you tell them to just do it, so you really have to just do it. And so what I did with exercise, and again, I had already lost my weight, so the point I wanna make is, yes, you should exercise, you need to exercise, but let's say you can't. Let's say you've just had surgery or you're, we have people in wheelchairs. Let's say you really can't exercise. What I want you to know is you can still lose weight. I did not exercise and I was hypothyroid without medicating and I still lost 47 pounds. It took me 27 months, but I still did it. And that just shows that it's the food, like Dr. McDougall says. So 
what happened is when he kind of called my bluff or whatever you want to say, called my called bullshit, and he said, you need to exercise. I didn't like to exercise. And so what I did is I chose the exercise I hated the least, which was yoga. Now, the kind of yoga I was doing and the kind that I still do, I started on in the was August 19th 2011 even before I started losing weight now that I think about it it's called yin yoga and it's a very good type of exercise it's for the long muscles and the fascia but we stay in one place the whole 90 minutes so I don't think it's a huge calorie burner if at all but it's really great for the uh, the, the, the psychological benefits it's really great for flexibility then I realized I needed to do a little bit more I wasn't doing any cardio and at the time I didn't have Bailey my dog was like 15 and couldn't walk and so I had the privilege of teaching at Rancho La Puerta in Mexico. It's a wonderful five-star spot. If you ever get a chance to go, put that on your bucket list, please. And all they do there all day is exercise from like five in the morning till six at night. And they have all these hikes and every kind of exercise you can imagine from Pilates to yoga to Tabata to circuit training to water aerobics to pickleball. I mean, they have things I never heard of. And so I'm there, there's nothing else to do. So I got, I tried all these different kinds of classes and my knee is still bad. As a matter of fact, I just went to physical therapy today to try to figure out six years later what we can do about this. So I'm kind of limited in what I can do, but what I noticed is that I could spin and the teacher said boy you spin for 45 minutes depending on how hard you work you're putting 400 to 600 calories and I really liked spinning because it was over pretty quickly it was easy I knew I wasn't gonna hurt myself like I did when I played pickleball and um, I, it was just I liked it more for the mental benefits because I'm a very anxious person and it just really really helped and so like I said, I did nothing to lose the weight. I do. This is my exercise routine now when I'm in town is I spin three days a week, usually Tuesday, Thursday, and either Saturday or Sunday. Once in a while, a fourth day, but not usually. And my spin class is 60 minutes long. And then on the other days, I do the yin yoga. I do it myself at home now. I'm no longer affiliated with the studio and I do it for 60 to 90 minutes. And I'll do it while watching like a Dr. McDougall webinar. And I walk Bailey twice a day for 45 minutes. And so that's the routine that I have now that I've used to maintain my weight loss but I promise you and you can ask people that knew me I didn't exercise till I was 52 and not to lose weight no exercise I know I know that yeah do you want to do a standing yoga pose right now um, well everybody loves your top by the way oh, they all want you. to know where you got yeah, it well, from. That is when it, I got it at one of the engine 2 conferences that I have the privilege of speaking at it's a rip shirt a rip rip shirt. yep you can see from the back it's engine 2 and I do like it too thank you so your question now, Ashley, when you say I'm at a healthy weight but I need to lose 10 to 15 pounds, are you sure? And the reason I say that is we don't recommend weighing yourself on a traditional scale in the Ultimate Weight Loss Program. We don't recommend weighing at all. We recommend you going by how you look and how you feel and how your clothes fit. And if you do weigh yourself, no more than once a month. But the thing is, is what are you weighing when you weigh yourself? So the there's something called the BIA, the Bioimpedance Analysis, that Dr. Carrie Saunders, who's an expert in food addiction, uses. And she's actually going to be speaking next Labor Day at our first live Ultimate Weight Loss Conference in Las Vegas. And I hope you'll get on the main list so you can find out. Details will be coming soon. Dr. Goldhammer, Dr. Lyle, and John Pierre, and myself will also be speaking. And so she'll have this device there where you can actually find out what your weight is. And so the weight is the gravitational pull. And when you weigh and get a number, are you weighing your muscle? Are you weighing your bone? Are you weighing your fat? Are you weighing the amount of intracellular water you have in your tissues or extracellular water? Are you weighing the amount of stool in your colon? So you don't know because, you know, people say, well, carbs make me fat. Well, no, they don't. You eat a potato at 10 o'clock at night and you're going to hold on a little bit of water and some of that's going to be uh, glycogen in your muscles and liver, but that's not fat. And when people say they want to lose weight, what I think most people want to lose is fat. We could cut your leg off, you'd probably lose weight, but you don't want to lose your leg, right? So that's why it's important to know what you're weighing. And you could probably get this test, it's somewhere near you. You would Google BIA, bioimpedance analysis. A lot of hospitals have the machine, they can do it. It's not very, very expensive. But here's the thing, if you're close to what you feel your goal weight is, first of all, you might be perfect right now. I, I don't believe this young lady's in the Ultimate Weight Loss Program, so I don't know what she looks like. A lot of times women want to be thinner than, than they need to be. And I say need to be because you, if you are healthy and you say you're at a healthy weight and you feel good and you look good, 
is it really going to be worth what you have to do to lose that last 10 to 15 pounds? And I say that because I work with people that have to. And when I say have to, it's their job. I live in LA and I have people that are models and actresses where if they don't get down to the certain weight and fit the costume or get the camera angle right, they won't get the job. And these people come to me thinner than me, beautiful, and it's, it, it's not that we can't do it. It's just that it's more difficult because you do have to tighten the screws. And by that, what you have to do is you probably have to eat to the left of the left of the red line. In other words, you have to eat at a calorie density even lower than the 567 per pound. You have to concentrate more on the fruits and vegetables, and you have to eat more raw in relation to cook, which means you're gonna be eating less starch, which is not gonna be as satisfying, and you may have to exercise more. Now, you said you're doing 10,000 steps a day, but that's great, but are you walking slow? Are you walking fast? Are you getting any cardio in? What kind of strength training are you doing? Because the thing is, is one of the best ways to lose fat is to build muscle. And if you build muscle, the number on the scale is gonna go up because muscle weighs more than fat. But exercise is the only way I know of to safely increase your metabolism. And what's great about having more muscle is that muscle is metabolically active, so you burn more calories at rest. So if you need to really lose those last 10 to 15 pounds, you have to be even stricter uh, with this and eat more let more of the calorie dilute foods make sure that you're not using any of the Stimulants in food like oil sugar salt or flour that make you exponentially eat more food and you may have to exercise more doing more cardio and doing more strength training the other two things people that are very close to their goal weight can do are sequencing their meals, which is eating food in order of increasing caloric density, where instead of starting with your big bowl of mashed potatoes, you eat a soup, a salad, or some fruit first, lower the caloric density to try to fill the tank with the more calorie dilute foods first, or you do what's called intermittent fasting, which is different than water fasting, where you narrow the feeding window. Now, on the True North website, healthpromoting.com, there's a wonderful article written by Dr. Jennifer Morano, who's the co-founder with Dr. Alan Goldhammer, also his wife of True North, and she explains what that is. But what intermittent fasting is, is simply narrowing the feeding window. So instead of waking up at six and eating breakfast at seven, you wait until say 11 or 12 to eat your first meal, and then you eat your last meal about five o'clock so that you have a window of just six hours a day where you're eating food and then the other 12 hours you're fasting and the article explains scientifically why this works but again you know is it worth it because if it's going to create an eating disorder for you to have to do this I think that many people are at healthy weights that are fine and they want to be thinner because we've been sold a bill of goods by the advertising industry that somehow thinner is better listen the only thing that is good about being thin is or being thinner, if, if like me, you have really bad orthopedic problems. With my compromised knee, every pound I'm overweight is five pounds of pressure to my knee. So I need to be leaner to not have pain, but I weighed 10 pounds more a couple years ago. I was a six instead of a four. Um, I looked fine, and so, so that's the thing. And I need to go back to the question about relapse because I just thought of something really important when I talked about my size. One of the things that you can do to help prevent relapse is to not keep multiple sizes of clothes in your closet. About eight years ago, I had my very first client and I helped this woman who was only about five foot one inches tall go from a size 14 to a size four in only, I believe, seven months. And she was ecstatic because her HMO was sending her to this program for people that were in danger of you know, uh, cardiovascular disease and having to go on statins. And she did great and then her dog died and she went back up to a size eight and that's where she is now and, and, and she's still, you know, not she's not doing too bad. But the problem with this client was is that she kept all her clothes from all her different weights. And if you do that, it's just too easy to fit back into them. Now, when I started my weight loss journey five years ago, I was a size 14 and uh, extra large. And I, now I am a size four and an extra small, small, extra small, depending on the brand. Every time I lost weight, and of course I, I went down one size at a time, about every 10 pounds is a size. So I went from a 14 to a 12, a 12 to a 10, a 10 to an eight, eight to a six, and a six to a four. I got those clothes out of the house immediately. Now, I don't have a lot of money and I'm a frugal person and I don't wanna have to be buying new clothes. And so keeping stuff from your old lifestyle, whether it's the food, the alcohol, or the clothes, is a really bad idea because if you know that that's all you have to wear, and it doesn't fit, you're gonna have to, 
you know, tighten up the screws. And the other thing I recommend is, yeah, I'm wearing leggings now because I just came from physical therapy and I actually had to do stuff, but don't just get all loosey-goosey clothes. When I weighed 165 pounds when I was a pastry chef, people said, oh, you didn't look that fat to me. Well, chef clothes expand. It's the coats are not fitted. The pants are drawstring pants. I hit it very well, but I recommend getting clothes that are your size that fit. Don't to get them too tight, but don't just get sweatpants and that, that also can help when that's all you have to wear. <coughs> all right, we got another question from Jan. We use all these words and terms, people don't quite get what they mean. Right. So we're just gonna ask you the easy question, we probably mentioned it twice yeah. or so, so today. Well, what is a trigger food? So a trigger food, that's a great question, Jan. It's Halloween. Halloween, and you know, it, it's different things to different people. I believe there's a difference between what is an addictive food and what is a trigger food. Now, Roz was talking about how when she eats sweet potatoes cubed, she overeats. So I don't believe that sweet potatoes are addictive. I don't believe any whole natural food, even nuts, are addictive the same way that sugar, flour, alcohol is addictive. But for her, it could be a trigger food. The way I define a trigger food is any food that you personally overeat on a food that you will eat in the absence of hunger. So I've never known any whole natural food to be a trigger food. Now, I make a delicious recipe, uh, a balsamic Dijon glazed Brussels sprouts, and they're so good they taste like candy. Even people that hate vegetables or Brussels sprouts like them. And I will make them and I might eat the whole two pounds. It's that good, it tastes like candy. But if I'm full, I'm not gonna eat even one of them. But there's foods like generally uh, hand to mouth foods, uh, nuts, How about your burnt granola? My granola, oh my the one made with nuts and dates. So these are foods and they're generally not uh, whole natural foods. They may be a conglomeration of them, but these are foods that you will eat in the app, no matter how full you are, you're still gonna have room for, and they will cause you to exponentially overeat. Now, I don't think nuts are addictive, like I said, like sugar, flour, and alcohol, but for me, they are a trigger food, because if I eat one Brazil nut, which I try to do for a selenium, next thing you know, I'm in the peanut butter, because when I get that little taste of those high fat, dopamine producing foods, I want more and more and more. The other thing is, is something can be a whole natural food, but when you combine it or make a certain way, it could be a trigger food. So for example, uh, one of the recipes in my first webinars is very popular, especially if you travel, are the millet muffins made with blueberries, pineapple, or cherries. Mm. And these are made from whole grains like millet and oats, and these are made from sweet potatoes and bananas. Now these are all foods that by themselves probably are not gonna be trigger foods for most people. That said, bananas are definitely trigger foods for some people, as are grapes or all the high sugar foods and the dry foods. But something happens when you take these whole natural foods, just like Penny mentioned, the granola, when you take the oats with the dates and the almonds and you put them together into what our brain and our eyes think of as a treat, like a muffin, and for some people now, these can become trigger foods. So I define a trigger food as anything that you personally will eat in the absence of true hunger and that will cause you to overeat or eat other foods that you had not intended to eat. Perfect. The next question is coming from Colleen. Hello, Colleen. Hi, Colleen. I, I just met her. She's lovely, her and her husband at the Veg Fest. She was in the front row, remember? Hmm. You were in the front row. I think I think you were sitting next to her, actually, Ken. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. Colleen wants to know where corn, tortilla, corn tortillas fit in and if there are any foods that are acceptable once you reach your goal weight that are not recommended while working toward, toward your goal? Okay, good question, but first I gotta say one more thing about relapse. Oh, she's gone, where'd she go? I, she's have, gone. I have a oh. couple of tools I use to prevent relapse. Here we go, relapse. ready to go. So here's a picture of my mentor, Dr. Alan Goldhammer, who along with Dr. Doug Lyle and Dr. McDougall are responsible for me becoming a skinny bitch. Point, look at that point. I have that on my refrigerator and I have that in my wallet. So it really makes me think twice I also have this bobblehead of Dr. Alan Goldhammer made, and it only says no. So if I say, can I have this, can I have that, it just no. literally says no. And I have this little thing, so. Hey, there he is. Hi, yeah. Dr. Goldhammer. Yep. Alan, so. we're like buddies now. All right, so those are just my fun little relapse tools. Okay, so Colleen, let's talk about corn tortillas. So. In the 21 day recipe guide with the delicious recipes you get when joining the Ultimate Weight Loss Program, there's one recipe, maybe two, that have corn tortillas. And one of it's the enchilada strata. 
I think there's a difference when you take a few corn tortillas, that recipe has six, and it's baked in so it sort of melts and it's a big casserole than when you just kind of are baking them into chips or eating them into tacos. Like with the Air Pop popcorn, the water has been removed. The fiber and the nutrients are still intact, but what happens, it's not as calorically dense as Air Pop popcorn at 1,800 calories a pound, but corn tortillas are about five, they're about 1,000 to 1,100 calories a pound. Whole corn with the water and fiber intact and the nutrients and the phytochemicals is 500 calories a pound. So tortillas are more than twice as calorically dense. And while most people probably couldn't eat more than two or three ears of corn at a sitting, and by the way, it takes 16 ears of corn to make just one tablespoon of corn oil, I have seen people eat a ton of corn tortillas because again, we've removed the water, which means we've reduced the bulk, which means we've reduced the satiety. That said, if it's something you can monitor, if it's not a trigger food for you, I don't see it as a big problem, even though it is to the right of the red line and higher in caloric density. So are there foods that you can incorporate after you've reached goal weight? That is gonna be a very personal thing because as I mentioned in one of the previous installments of Weight Loss Wednesday, they had there was a girl, in the, this, she's still there, I'm not gonna say her name because she may not want me to, in the Ultimate Weight Loss Program, it got down to a size two, looked <clears> gorgeous, <throat> still is gorgeous, and decided to reintroduce some of the foods to the right of the red line like the dried fruit and nuts to make like date nut bars and lar bars and like almost immediately gained five percent of her weight back so the thing is again sometimes it's harder to moderate the use of these foods now i personally as a recovering food addict don't recommend any amount of sugar any amount of flour any amount of uh alcohol and by sugar I mean the real and the fake the zero caloric and the caloric so the stevia the erythritol xylitol stevia that's all really bad worse probably than regular sugar for food addiction definitely worse for your microbiome so I don't recommend anybody use those foods at least if you are suffering from food addiction and you're trying to maintain your weight they're just too high in caloric density that said nuts can be helpful and dried fruit can enhance a recipe if you're not free feeding on either of them so we don't tell people you can never have nuts you can never have seeds you can never have avocado or dried fruits it's just that these very caloric concentrated foods you have to be mindful of now i personally never reintroduced anything to the right of the red line because now that i've had a taste of both thinness and volume eating i don't want to do that because i I just, I like the way I eat, I like the food I have, I like the amount I have, and if I start eating avocado and seeds and, and, and nuts again, I'm not gonna be able to eat as much of the other stuff. So the answer is, it's gonna be an individual thing, but again, it, it's, it can be a slippery slope, and I recommend that people be abstinent for a really long time before they retest it, and I only retest it when I'm in a controlled environment. So anytime I've tried to eat foods to the right of the red line, I was at True North with Dr. Goldhammer right there telling me, no, you're not gonna do this again. And that's what happened last Christmas when I ate my pecan pie. Um, again, it didn't cause me to relapse, it didn't cause me to gain weight, but all it did cause me to think about pecan pie for like a month, so for me, it wasn't worth it. Mm -hmm. Pecan pie. <clears throat> There's one in the freezer because you're coming for dinner uh, Saturday night for a friend's uh, surprise birthday party. Is she going to be listening to this? No, nah, I don't think she watches. Oh. <laughs> if she does, then we're in big trouble. <clears throat> Oops. We won't say her name. Kathy? Oops. I didn't say that. I, I thought know. it was Shada's birthday. No. <clears throat> Not Shada's birthday. No, nope, she's a Virgo. I know. The incredible um, Shada. What are we going to talk about one next? One more question? We got one more question. All right, and if you see anything up there, yeah. if you want to ask, please feel. Oh, free. people keep asking where where can they can get more information about this diet? You know, the, well, please well, the consider program. joining our Ultimate Weight Loss Program. It's run by myself and John Pierre, a nutritional and fitness expert who works with lots of celebrities. You just go to eatunprocessed.com and consider signing up. It's very affordable, and you get ongoing support. Well, Elise Bennett wants to give her mom a shout out. Has been a whole food, plant based for the last two months <clears throat> and just lost a little over 10 pounds. Very good. She has HBP, hoping will be above. High blood pressure. High blood pressure. See, I'm not so high tech yeah. here. Yeah. Above to get off her meds. Yeah, make sure she's not <clears throat> using salt then. Stay and by the salt. way, there are people that despite perfect diet, still cannot always get their blood pressure down and then they go to True North and fast and they do. And there's some medical research on their website to support this. Totally considered. Yeah. Well, let's ask this question right. from the Be Vivica. Vivica. Uh, Vivica. Yeah. <clears throat> she asks, how do you navigate small, intimate parties where no compliant food exists? 
You know what the word complain is? That's another one of these words that we use in this uh, yeah, ultimate weight loss yeah, program. Even though Kenny doesn't need to lose weight, he's learning so much, he's just losing oh it by gosh, osmosis. So crazy. compliant means following a prescribed course of action. It's a term that's used in medicine often. And Vivica, it's a great question. And if you are going to be in the webinar tonight with Dr. Ifland, I recommend you also get her take on this. So how do you navigate a small party where there's going to be no compliant food available? So you have a few choices. And just know, guys, that you always have options. And one option is always not to eat. True North, where I have the privilege of working every Christmas, this year I'll be there the 23rd of December to January 2nd, please consider signing up for the holiday cooking extravaganza. I have seen people that were slender fast for 40 days. And if that's possible, people can skip one meal and they're not going to die. So you always, if there really truly is nothing to eat, so for example, if you were an ethical vegan and you went to a party that there was nothing but animal products. An ethical vegan would not eat. They would not eat for any reason. Cheesecake with whipped cream. They, they wouldn't make. They wouldn't eat to make people happy. They wouldn't. They, they would not eat. It's similarly, somebody that keeps kosher. If they go someplace where there's only bacon served, they're just not going to eat. And so, but with women, we find that they're generally more people pleasing and they are more accommodating, more agreeable, and it's very hard for them to stand up for themselves in this arena, especially if the people with the food are what I call food bullies. So this is, these are skills that we teach, especially in the in-person program where you have time to really work with the people one-on-one -on -one. the next time we're running. This will be in January in Los Angeles. It's a sm very small focus group of about 20 people. So what you can do, let's just go through your options. So you can go to the party and just eat whether it's on your plan or not, whether it's animal products, you could just decide, okay, I'm just gonna, I can't take the pressure, I'm just gonna eat, and that's just one meal, and I'm gonna do the other 20, uh, 20 meals that week are gonna be plant perfect and SOS free, and I'm just gonna do it. So that's an option, and again, there's no judgment here, you're gonna do what's best for you. So that's one option. The other option is you get there, and you find out what's there, and maybe what's there, maybe there's something there that's on your plan, and so then you just eat that. The third option is don't eat. And you, what you can do when you don't eat is you can either tell them why you're not eating or you know you can you could just say, look, I'm really sorry I had a late lunch, I'm not hungry. Uh, what you could do, and I've had uh, people do that, is they've pulled the hostess aside or host aside and said, look, I don't wanna make a big thing about this, um, but I, I just got a really, I just threw up or I just got a really bad bout of diarrhea. So I don't want people to know I'm fine. Uh, you know, it's just something I ate, but wait, you know, could I just have a club soda or some tea, but let's just not keep it on the QT. That's worked beautifully for a lot of people. Or you could say, you know, oh my God, I just, I, the doctor had a, a change of schedule. I'm having a colonoscopy tomorrow and I have to fast. You know, they'll just, they'll make these things up just for other people's because it's it just seems better than than trying to explain your diet and why you eat this way because what happens a lot of times is when we eat differently especially if we eat better than other people and especially if we're losing weight they perceive it as a loss of status i encourage you to go to dr lyle's website esteemeddynamics.org where he talks about this and so therefore it can be confronting to them <coughs> if they think they're like this perfect person eating these perfect foods that's why for me i really do have food allergies and it really does work for me because um, you know, I really, I am allergic to black pepper, which is in almost everything. There's a lot of stuff I can't eat, and I, I let my host know that in advance. And a lot of, in, in a lot of ways, if you think about sugar and flour and alcohol as allergens, because even though you may not have an anaphylactic re reaction, we break out in fat when we eat that. We break out in discordant brain chemistry. So what you can do is you can call your hosts or hostess in advance. And you can, depending on how close they are to, to you, you can explain the situation. You can say, look, I really appreciate the invitation. I'm looking <laughs> forward to coming, but um, I'm on a very special diet, doctor's orders. So would you mind if, again, you can say, I didn't eat, uh, you just made me a couple of baked potatoes or offer to bring something and offer to bring something specific so they can't say no. Because a lot of hostesses can't really think outside the box and say, can I bring <coughs> something? Well, no, because they already know they're making A, B, and C. But if you said to them, hey, would it be all right if I brought a very large, delicious salad from my garden, uh, hearty, delicious to, for everyone to share. If you make or a, a fruit, you know, make it specific and delicious because you know it's, it's a lot of work to cut up fruit and to cut up salad. And then if they say yes, you're home free because you'll have a salad, you'll have some starch in it, like some some uh, steamed potatoes or some rice or quinoa or wild rice. And so and it's going to be delicious. And so that is that's what I generally do. 
And then the last option, and by the way, I think I mentioned if you're on the uh, webinar tonight, let's see what Dr. Iflund says about this. The other option is don't go because I just say no. Because for me, I mean, if you have to go because if it's a work thing, you have to go. But I don't, I don't accept most social invitations that involve food. I almost never do, as a matter of fact, because I don't want to be fat and sick to make somebody else happy. And you know, my husband, he's not a food addict. It took him a while to understand why I couldn't go out to dinner with him to a restaurant for his birthday or an, or his an, or our anniversary. He goes out with my friend Tim. Actually, Kenny, Tim, move. You might have to be Charles's date from now on. But but it's that important to me. See, my recovery is the most important thing to me, and it's not just about being thin, guys. And yes, I am thin. But my thinness is a result of healing my brain chemistry, of overcoming the food addiction. You heal the brain, the body follows. And so I would, unless it was absolutely necessary, I would just say no, because I don't want to be put in an environment which is going to trigger me, which is going to ha cause me to have cravings, because visual cues are very, very powerful. With that said, I hope uh, you enjoyed today's installment of Weight Loss Wednesday. I hope you learned something. If you have questions, the best way, because this is a very long thread usually, I can't always see everything, so the best thing would be to go to my website, www.enumprocess.com, submit your question through there. Consider signing up for my mailing list as well and checking out the Ultimate Weight Loss Program. So guys, have a great holiday. You know, stay, stay compliant is the best advice I can. Stay away from that sugar, flour, and alcohol and uh, consider signing up for tonight's webinar. It's an eight webinar series. Even if you have to miss one time, there'll be replays. You can watch them over and over again. You can find that at the webinar page at eatunprocess.com. Thanks so much for watching. I'm Chef AJ, and I truly believe that you can have both the health and the body you deserve.